Good morning, everybody. Thanks, Frank. If I haven't met you, I'm Dale. I work here. Some of you are like, I've been coming to this church for three weeks. Who are you? Good question. So, it's good to be back with you all. If you didn't know, I was um, in Rwanda the past, I don't know, week, eight days with my daughter. And um, last Sunday, we did church for about nine hours. So there was like three hours of singing before I even got up there. And it's not just singing, it's singing, dancing, singing, singing. Let's just say they love to hold the microphone and they love it when it's turned up all the way. And let's just say their buildings are made out of adobe so it just echoes like nobody's business. And it's just awesome. So, and when it's time to dance, they're like even the most conservative churches, they just go, dance. And so they all start dancing. And I just, I used to dance with them. Now I'm just like, I'm enjoying you all as you're dancing because it just comes out really bad. So, but it's good. It's good to be back. We're entering into a season um, in the Christian calendar and the Christian rhythm called Lent. And it's a time of preparation. It's a preparation for, uh, for the resurrection. And as I said, if you were able to watch the Ash Wednesday video that we created. We are in such, there's so many of us that get in a hurry for Resurrection Day or just like, well, it's Easter. I don't really like to deal with the downer stuff because Jesus died and rose again. We don't have to deal with that anymore. But I think if we forget our own mortality, I think if we forget that life can be hard sometimes, we drift and we can all of a sudden get there. So I think it's important to have a season where you sit and wonder and you challenge yourself. We're going to go through the book of Ecclesiastes a little bit. And if you're like, I don't like the book of Ecclesiastes because it's a downer. Welcome. (laughs) The opening of the book of Ecclesiastes is one of the most um, powerful and poignant messages that I have found in Scripture. So we're going to read a lot of it right now. The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem... Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless, everything is meaningless. I know, you're like, this dude's having a bad day. What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, there they return again. All things are wearisome. More than one can say, the eye is never enough of seeing, nor the ear its full of hearing. What has been done, what has been, will be again. What has been done, will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new. It was already here long ago. It was here before our time. No one remembers the former generations. And even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. I, the teacher, was king over Israel and Jerusalem. I applied my mind to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. What a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless. A chasing after the wind. What is crooked cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. I said to myself, look, I have increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. I have experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. Then... I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly, but I learned that is too. It's chasing after the wind. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. And that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is madness. 
And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embraced folly, my mind still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired male and female singers and a harem as well, the delights of a man's heart. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was the reward for all my toil. Yet, when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind, nothing was gained under the sun. Then I turned my thoughts to consider wisdom and also madness and folly. What more can the king's successor do than what's already been done? I saw that wisdom is better than folly, just as light is better than darkness. The wise eyes have in their heads while the fool walks in the darkness. But I came to realize that the same fate overtakes them both. Then I said to myself, the fate of the fool will overtake me also. What then do I gain by being wise? I said to myself, this too is meaningless, for the wise, like the fool, will not long be remembered. The days have already come when both have been forgotten. Like the fool, the wise too must die. So I hated life, because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless. The chasing after the wind, I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to one who comes after me. And who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish. Yet they will have control over all the fruit of my toil into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. So my heart began to despair over all my toilsome labor under the sun. For a person may labor with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then they must leave all they own to another who has not toiled for it. This too is meaningless and a great misfortune. What do people get for all the toil and anxious striving with which they toil under the sun? All their days their work is grief and pain, even at night their minds do not rest. This too is meaningless. A person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. This too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? To the person who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. This too is meaningless. A chasing after the wind. Father, help us to understand. These words feel so heavy. Some of us may be wondering, why is this even in the Bible? Where's my good ending? Where's my quick fix? Where's my, but it all turns out okay right now. God, help us to sit in this for a moment, if not for days, for weeks. For when we are honest is when we really see you and find you. In your name, amen. If you've never heard that beginning of Ecclesiastes before or read it, you might be thinking, what kind of book is this? Wasn't there a committee meeting about what kind of book should be in the Bible? How did this one sneak through. Hmm. For sure, this book is countercultural, subversive in a way. 
And if you're looking for some solid ground to stand upon, even as you heard these things, but like, where's my happy ending in the midst of this? Be patient. Because there's some honesty that has to come first. Obviously, there's a word that kept popping up. Which is one of the words that kept popping up? Meaningless. It's the Hebrew word, havel. It means uh, breath, or vapor, or mist, stuff, everything you can think of, even wisdom. Your body, your house, your car, your investments, your online presence, your Instagram followers, your TikTok videos, your ideas, your wisdom, your thoughts, your intelligence. The writer says vapor, vapor, vapor. In case you don't really get what vapor means, I bought show and tell. (laughs) Vapor. (laughs) I so want to twist it. (laughs) Oh. Vapor, mist. If you've been in really hot weather, which some of you might be going, I don't even remember hot weather. My son-in-law is from Palm Springs. His friend is from Palm Springs. He's like, dear Lord, where did I move to? God's country of frozen tundra. (laughs) I was in Africa for a week praying for it to cool down. I did not give God clarification of the location of my prayers. (laughs) For when I came home, I found snow. Mist. When you're really hot, you're sitting in a restaurant, they have these misters in Palm Springs. I've been there and I'm like, the, the fact that they need misters in an outdoor environment tells you how hot it is. Mist momentarily feels good, but let's be honest, you need more. Havel. So when the teacher is saying meaningless, meaningless, these things are meaningless, they feel good for a moment. Is that, am I getting you yet? This is like the Shamu show. If you sit too close, you might get wet. (laughs) Megan's like, it's the Holy Spirit. No, it's my spray bottle, Megan. That's all it is. It's mist. It's vapor. It doesn't mean it doesn't feel good. It just means it's not satisfying. We all know this intuitively. There's a second phrase that gets used a lot in this, not just havel, meaningless. It's this phrase, under the sun. It's a euphemism for like from birth to death. It's your life. He says like all their labors which they toil under the sun. There is nothing new under the sun. All that my hands have done I have toiled to achieve. Everything was meaningless. The chasing after the wind that was gained under the sun or under heaven. It's the realm of the created. I'm going to get a little deep here. There's these things that are meaningless, and the the teacher here is saying there's this realm of the created, the things that have been made under the sun. The things we devise, create, construct, organize, administrate, write. And when he uses this phrase, under the sun, the teacher is talking about the things you do in your life. Anything, anything you do. You write, it's beautiful. Maybe you're an artist, you make things, you're a business person, you create things, you make income, you do these things, and those are all the created realm. The things you design, the things that you put your energy to. Some of you might go, I get it, I get it, this is like wisdom literature, but what kind of wisdom is this? Because usually there's like these paths of wisdom, like in the book of Proverbs, or some of the Psalms, and they make calendars of this, like a wise saying for today. I have never seen a calendar where they're like, a little thought from Ecclesiastes today as you go out. Just remember, your life is meaningless. (laughs) But usually there's this wisdom, and it says, the wise go one direction, the foolish go the other. The wise are blessed, and the fools are left to themselves. Examples, when the wise use money well, the fools don't. If you do this, your kids will turn out good. You do the right things, you'll get the right stuff, hashtag blessed. The wise do this and live, the foolish do this and die. 
It's almost like we keep score. We like that kind of wisdom, but that's not this. There's not just two categories for wisdom. It's not just if you're wise, you do this, and it all works out. And if you're foolish, you do this, and you deserve it. Because isn't it true that some of us have strived to do the right things, and you've done the right things, and sometimes things still don't turn out the way you thought they should? Maybe you got sick, and you can think of everybody else who deserved it more than you because you've been doing the right things in your life. See, the writer is challenging all the things. He is saying, I did all the right things, and things still turned out bad. And this book says, I did all the wrong, and I still found God. So really, this sermon, this book is his resume, saying, I did it all, I bought it all, I experienced it all, I had everything anyone could ever dream of, and I found it wasn't satisfying. The writer questions the simple categories. He makes the, I don't know the answer, a viable one. He creates this new category. I thought I did everything right, and it still fell short. I watch somebody live a foolish life and crashed and burned and somehow they found God. How does that work? You may do all the right things, this writer says, and the fool still outlives you. How does that help? Because we assume that the end result will lead us to another place of peace, joy, and eternal contentment. This is what the teacher is challenging. If we're honest with ourselves, we get what he's saying, don't we, a little bit? That I've done things so right and so well, and I've always tried to be a good girl or a boy or whatever. I live my life in a certain way, and it still hurts sometimes. You can do all the moral and best things compared to those around you, and the fool still lives longer. A week ago, we were doing some evangelism in uh, these deep villages in Rwanda. And my daughter can attest to this. They pretty much just set up shop in a road or wherever, and they just sing, and then they go, Dale, go. And I'm like, all right, here we go. And the pastor was telling me that for a few decades, evangelists would go out deep into the villages and make all sorts of promises to people. We commonly know that as kind of the prosperity gospel. And they would tell these people who are so deeply entrenched in their cycles of poverty that they're told by someone, if you come to church, give your life to Jesus, that all will turn. Suddenly you'll have money. Suddenly you'll have these things. Like if you just come to church and they were building their own little kingdoms. He says, we're still recovering from decades of preaching like that. And I said to him, so are we. Because how often do we say, if you just love Jesus enough, the things you've always wanted, you'll get. Even though Jesus never said that. There's a little help in understanding Ecclesiastes. These are the writings of Solomon or someone about Solomon. The songs of Solomon are really Solomon in his youthfulness. Talking about love in a very erotic way. I remember reading the Song of Solomon, and my youth pastor said, just don't read that, Dale. It's not good for a young man to read that. And I'm like, he's just talking about his wife having the neck of like a tree. He's like, that's not what it means. I'm like, oh, I know. Some of you are like, what is he talking about? Go home and read Song of Solomon 7. It's a good time. Proverbs. Probably the adult Solomon sharing it with his sons. Here's advice for life. We get that. We like that. Ecclesiastes, it's end of life Solomon. Now whether he wrote it or somebody wrote it about what he thought, because Solomon really crashes and burns at the end of his life. It's looking back and being honest. And Ecclesiastes is really what we would modern day call a master class taught by a master teacher. And this master teacher disrupts you. He's not just telling you something you already know. Because if we're drawn to hearing just what we already know, there's no need for a teacher, is there? Because a master teacher challenges you and disrupts you and goes, what do you think about this? 
You're not being taught if you're like, I'm just looking for somebody who already tells me what I know. You're just looking for affirmation of your own narrow thoughts. There are times we need to be challenged. Even if it's something at the end, like, I don't really agree, your mind needs to be moved. A master teacher creates space, a disruption. I need something different, a truth that I need to understand. So he's talked about Havel, this mist. He's talked about under the sun. And what this teacher is saying, there's a different space. There's a new way of looking at things, of questioning things. And you have to have a ruthless examination of your own life to get it. A ruthless examination of your own life. Not to shame yourself. Not to condemn yourself, but it's one of those things you wake up and go, what am I doing? Who have I become? You see, there's this key phrase in the teacher's message, which I think is such a great phrase for us during Lent. The, the phrase, yet when I surveyed. It means when I took a moment and actually thought about my life. I thought about my pursuits. I thought about the direction of my heart where I spend my time. And all his hands have done. This is the ruthless examination of your life. Existentially, it's kind of the morning after. The morning after a big purchase, the morning after a decision you have made, it's the morning after, it's the next day, and you go, Whoa, I'm not sure I want to do that again. I had it all, he said. I did it all. I experienced it all. Everything you think, if I just had this, the teacher had it. I bought it. I financed it. I created it. I did it. Here's what I saw. This book is about the morning after you get the thing you've always longed for. Man, we long for some things. I remember growing up, and there was a guy who lived around the corner from me, and his dad owned a Baskin-Robbins ice cream shop. And then I had heard he actually owned three. And I thought, how great would it be if your dad owned an ice cream shop? My dad just designed buildings. How lame was that for a seven-year-old? Dad, can't you buy an ice cream shop every year for Halloween? He would hand out, not candy, but certificates or coupons for a free scoop of ice cream. Dear Lord, we just went, ha! Ah. We used to go home and change our outfits and go back and go, I haven't been here. One year I got three. That was a good year. I remember meeting his son in high school. I'm like, your dad owns the ice cream shops? He's like, my dad is not who you think my dad is. But in my head... Could life get any better than that? I remember in high school, my best friend, one of my dearest friends, his dad bought him a 1967 Mustang. Whew, you're right. Some of you are like, that sounds like an old car. It's like an old, amazing car. And so he bought it, and he came over, and, and we did what men do, like the proverbial, like, open up the hood. So we popped the hood. Neither one of us knew what we were looking for. We're just like, oh, yeah. We hadn't even had auto shop yet. But then he got it painted and new tires, and it was red, and his beautiful tires with raised white walls. And we cruised around, we're like, the chicks cannot even contain themselves. They could quite easily. But that's not what we thought as we listened to Leonard Skinner driving around Walnut Creek, because that's just what you do in Walnut Creek, I guess. We'd roll down the windows like we're in a Mustang. I'm like, life cannot get any better than this. Then his dad sold the car because he thought we were wasting too much time driving around town. When I was older, I remember sitting in a room. Lisa and I were married. This wasn't too long ago. Sitting in a room with a bunch of other couples, couples that we uh, just knew from, uh, I think, Anna's friends. And they were going around sharing about all their vacation homes. Well, when we go to Santa Barbara, when we go here, this and that, and um, Lisa and I didn't have a vacation home, so I went home, and I was like, that's got to be the answer. So I started looking like Google search, lake, uh, uh, affordable lakefront property in California. 
Nothing came up. <laughs> I'm like, we could go to Missouri. Not one of them in the conversation said, wow, I really regret buying it. So my heart, it's amazing how you drift and go, that's it, that's it, Lisa. Then I remembered I worked on weekends and I wouldn't be able to go anyway. So I'm like, I'm doing this for you, Jesus. I'm just letting go of this desire. There's nothing wrong with owning an ice cream shop, per se, or a 67 Mustang that was red and it was beautiful to drive around in, or owning a vacation home. The problem is, as soon as we go, my life would be better if I had this, is where we get into trouble. The Ecclesiastes message is, this is not what I thought it would feel like, this purchase of victory, the Super Bowl, even though I would like for the Niners to actually try and I want to see. It's kind of like you're like, you know, you read about like people win the lottery and their lives get ruined forever. I'm like, I just want to try. Those Chiefs fans have had enough. A movie, a promotion, or whatever, whatever you finally get, the teacher has the authority within purchasing the vapor by saying, when I surveyed what my hands had done. In the beginning of this message, we then get a little bit about God. He says, this too I see is from the hand of God, for without him who can eat or find enjoyment. He introduces God not in the inside of all these things, but kind of around the edges a little bit. What he's not saying is that God isn't involved in the things you love. He's just saying, introducing this as a format of like, here's all the things you've been doing, and yet there's God's kind of sitting around the outside. He's kind of saying, this Apple pencil, which is a beautiful thing, is like your whole life, beginning to end. And God sees it all around it and is hanging out around here. And he's like, you're toiling so much here in, within the created realm. I, the uncreated realm, am sitting around the outsides just wondering when you're going to invite me in. So the teacher says, these things are all meaningless, yet there's this God kind of around the outside. So within this created realm that we're all in, the bills, the permission slips for field trips that get lost and they're stuck in the bottom of backpacks next to the sandwich that didn't get eaten for a week. The things that fill our time, our minds, our needs. There are things on the edges, the teacher wrote. This is God. Watching. Waiting. Inviting you into something a little different. It's called life. Not sure if you remember this, but here's a, a photo of an event that happened, uh, I think, back in 2010. If you knew the news at all, there was a story about these Chilean miners who were stuck below ground for 69 days. During those 69 days of being stuck down in a mine, they must have wondered, will I ever feel the heat of the sun on my skin again? Will I ever see the people I love again? What's going to happen? This is one of the miners, I think, seeing either his wife, his sister, somebody who he loves. And in this moment, do you think this man is thinking, I wonder how my 401k is doing? I'm wondering how my red 1967 Mustang is doing. I'm wondering about my stuff. No, this man is going, I like that I'm alive. I like life. I think in this moment, this man is overwhelmed with the fact that life is a precious gift. In this moment, this man is in absolute awareness that life is a gift from God. And if you tap into that somehow, because no doubt life went on and he started to have other things. But if we can tap into that moment somehow where this moment of like life is actually a gift, maybe we manage our vapor a little differently. What I've seen is that most people approach their life like vapor management. 
they realize it's vapor, but they're just kind of like, how do I keep this all together? How do I manage my vapor? I want a better job, marriage, house, security, children, no more heartache. The thought is this, proper, proper vapor management brings you to a better place. Then Jesus comes, and he wakes you up to the thing you already have. He's trying to stop you from chasing all the things that you think you need when you already have something. Life. It's my experience that this comes when people crash, they start to see life. Maybe the things they've tried to do, it falls apart and they start to go, oh, I almost lost it all. Maybe they get really sick and they start to go, oh, this is life. Others, if they're fortunate, don't have those crash and burns, but they kind of say, that's it. As a pastor, over the past 34, 35 years, I have found that most people come in and want to talk to me around vapor management. How do I keep all these things together? And, that, and they seem real, and they're important. Like, they're things of life that we need, but the conversation is, how, how, how do, I'm losing this stuff. My life's changing. Someone has passed away. I'm being overlooked. And they want to talk about how to manage all those things. I can count on one hand over the past 35 years if somebody's come in and said, I just want to experience life as a gift. We are chasing after the wind and we don't even realize it. The master teacher of Ecclesiastes says, I got it all in the morning after. And then he says, there's really nothing there. So my question for you and for me is my life is my whole life around managing my vapor. To be fair, I wrote this sermon before I went to Rwanda, so I'm not just on this, you got to be more like that, but then I was in Rwanda, and I'm seeing these things, and I'm like, your vapor gets right in front of your face. Because Jesus comes, and he starts saying things like, the kingdom of God is not outside of you, but is where? Inside of you. He says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. What Jesus is not saying here, my friends, is here's the new formula to get the vapor. If you seek God first, then all these things will come to you. The setting your heart back towards my life as a gift from God. It is then you can address your vapor. Or at least see it for what it is. I in no way am saying the things we work for in life are bad or wrong. I'm just saying Jesus says I already gave you life. Not to get more vapor, but to understand the vapor and to use it in such a way that gives more life to other people. Because when you do this, seek God first, you become the kind of person that sees this as a precious gift. Then the vapor you do have, you appreciate it and see it for what it is. And then you do something with it. Something that matters. Something that really matters. A phrase we use in our family a lot. And my daughter and I use it a lot. It's not just about being appreciative of, your, of what you have. It's actually doing something with what you have. Because then the vapor becomes soothing for the moment for somebody else. A couple of thoughts as we close. The first one is this. You either live your life as an expression of something you, you have already received, or you're striving for something you do not have. That's the choice that Jesus gives. Seek God first. You're going to experience life which you already have, or you're in the pursuit of something which you do not have to make it better. The master teacher is expressing to you the things that are all around you. 
There is the created and the uncreated. The things we long for in the flesh is just vapor. Responding to the life we've been giving is the only thing that brings you peace and joy, is what he's saying. And when we find ourselves in union with God, and he takes over those spaces in your life, you then understand the thing, does not, the thing that does not have a beginning is not the vapor. It's the things that have a beginning and the end that we give so much energy to chasing. You'll never catch it. If your life is, if I can just be this or obtain that, then I can blank. It's a lie. Because one of the things I have found is that this lies to you it just does it just says if you had a little bit more if you had a little of this then you're going to have the life that jesus promised you jesus says you already have the life put it in the right order it's when i took those moments and said the vapor doesn't look out for my best interests why am i chasing it so much changed my life it changed everything I think that's the stronghold we live under a lot of times if I just had this if I just my kid just did this if I'm just faithful to God then it's all going to come work out it all works out Maybe just not the way you thought. Seek God and see how you can use your vapor to make others' lives better. Then do it. Because that's the wisdom. Be committed to doing the right thing and do it the right way. Because that's wisdom. Sometimes, friends... Sometimes things just don't seem fair, do they? Maybe I'm the only one. I, 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 I'm not, though. Let's just be honest. Sometimes things just don't seem fair. Like, wait, I've been doing things the right way, and I didn't get this. Life's still hard. I'm raising my kids with all the right things, and that they, they, they still don't like me. It's because they're teenagers. They turn sometimes. And you know this about me, but man, when I got sick, that was, my, that was my cry. This is not fair. God, don't you know how much I'm doing for you? And God's like, I got a whole nother plan. What you see is not fair. I see is redemption. So my friends, we all get stuck there. What's fair, what's not fair? And Solomon's saying, I've done all these things. I have a resume of acquiring things that trumps all of you. And what I'm telling you, it's vapor. Yet there's this God that he continues to invite into this message, which will continue to unfold as we go forward, that has something else to say in the midst of it to you. Because this is the teacher's pursuit. What really matters? How do I make sense of this? He is digging deeper and deeper, seeing if there's anything valuable along the way. And it starts with this question, which I invite you all in to start asking this week. When I survey all that my hands have done, what do I find? When you survey all that your hands have done, what are you looking at? Because it is from that point we either say, I want the life that God gave me or I want this vapor that's lying to me. Doesn't seem like much of a choice. But that's what Lent season can be about. So will you with me over the next weeks ask yourself, when I survey my life, it's not a point of shame or have I done anything with my life, but 
What's the direction of my heart? Can I let go? And God, can I experience the life that you gave me in the first place? God, I pray at the very foundation of everything in our life, the things we've worked for and strive for, and even if we've been doing it for your glory, may at the very foundation, may we let you reign. May we let you inform all the other things, not those things inform you. So God, we give those to you. We ask that you speak, you do move, you do things that we can't even imagine possible. We love you. In your name, amen. Let's thank God for meeting with us and being with us. I'm always, we take it for granted so much. Oh, yeah, God, of course you're going to do it. But I think it's like, God, thanks. We're his creation. He wants to give you life. Thanks for being here th this morning. I pray that God's spirit will empower you as you move throughout the week. Tonight we have our annual celebration of Night of Vision and Prayer. If you sign up for dinner, it starts at 5. Big dinner. If you didn't, we still love to have you. At 6 o'clock we're going to meet in here and talk about this next year and give a lot of praise and glory to God and ask him for his dear help as we move forward. So God bless you. Have a great day. Say hi to someone. Bless them. Encourage them as you head on out.